Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Barbados. Members of the media, welcome to Elara Court. Um, as you would recall, earlier this week during St. Andrew Speaks, the Prime Minister indicated that she would be speaking to the country on matters relating to NIS and some other critical issues. And this is that occasion. Uh, in a moment, she will address you, and then you will have an opportunity to ask many of those burning questions uh, that represent what Barbadians may be asking. Prime Minister, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Roy. Um, good afternoon to everybody on this overcast day. I hope everyone is safe, um, and I hope everyone is recognizing truly that we are living in different times in terms of going from, I call it the season of superlatives, the hottest, the driest, the wettest, Everything is an extreme event, and we certainly, for the first six months of this year, saw that with a drought, and now we are seeing um, flooding in certain districts as a result of the, an inundation of a lot of rain in a short period of time, and the government will try to respond to each, but as you know, we are going to have to change many of our rules that inform the designs for many of the things, the roads, the gutters, etc. But by now, my friends, you know that when circumstances require, come to you and say, let's have a heart to heart. And today is such an occasion. We need to be able to have a heart to heart about a number of things in this country. And, and this will happen periodically. We have done well, Barbadians. We have done well over the last five years. But I need us to stay focused. And I'm going to use the example of Shade Williams. And let me congratulate her on doing a repeat of the bronze and we will continue to support you my dear because you bring so much honor and pride to our nation and i want to thank stephen francis in jamaica her coach but as we watched her come around the corner how much ever as she lined up on the straight she was in good shape the race is not over until you cross the line it is no different with our country we have had over the course of the last five years five challenging years but we have come a long, long way from where we were when we first inherited the circumstances of this government. Indeed, I understand that for many of you, this is overwhelming. And you're going to say, wait, another one? We still about here doing this? When are we going to finish? All of that I get, because the world in which we live today is considerably different from that which you might have grown up in if you're older, um, over the age of 35, or from that which even in some instances, if you're young, your parents would have had the luxury of growing up in. It is completely different. And our circumstances in Barbados were compounded by the fact that our economy continued to experience major, major, major um, structural problems and declines over the course of the period of time of the, of the decade before we inherited. My friends, I want to say to you that in spite of all of that, I feel we can make it. But I feel that we need to be able to have a pep talk because there are those who may want to exploit your fatigue, your tiredness, and to stop you in your tracks, stop us in our tracks from being able to complete this race of transformation. I ask you to bear with us. Indeed, if the damage we inherited was modest, we could come out of this. But the damage that we inherited was deep and it was complex. And indeed, I'm not going to be able to deal with everything today. In a few weeks' time, I'm going to come and talk to you about education because the consequences to our educational system, which were driven by lack of reform as well as what has happened in COVID, are dire. And we will treat to them on another occasion. But today, I want to speak to you on a few issues. National insurance and what we are doing there with pension reform the issue updating you on SOE reform and updating you also on where we are with the Integrity Commission now that we've had it past the Parliament and to the extent that there are any other issues that you would wish to raise with me as members of the press, I'm prepared so to do. My friends, swift and decisive action was necessary at the beginning of this administration. And we had to do so largely because we did not have foreign exchange. I said it in St. Andrew Speaks this week. We inherited a government that had just over four weeks of foreign exchange. And we had, within that same first month, to pay Credit Suisse $100 million, to pay oil payments for oil payments, 
and it was the beginning of the hurricane season on the 1st of June. A hurricane season, by the way, that brought us Tropical Storm Kurt, which led to damage. The government took the decision within one week of election that the most important thing was to save the Barbados dollar. It was a view shared by the social partnership. The reality, however, was that the debt which precipitated us into a situation where 68, 69 cents in every dollar was being spent to service debt, couldn't go to education, couldn't go to support the hospital, couldn't go to do road infrastructure. The reason that debt existed and who facilitated it would have been the Central Bank of Barbados and the National Insurance Scheme predominantly. We took decisions, therefore, to be able to do two things at the outset. One, that we would have to ask Central Bank and the National Insurance to take a haircut in both instances. And at that time, we committed that over the course of time of growth in the decades following, Barbados government would seek to recapitalize both institutions in order to be able to keep them as above as we could. But there was a second amount owing, $457.5 million dollars made up of monies owed by all of the state-owned enterprises for the, all of the employees that work with them and all of central government's employees that simply had not been paid by the last government for more than three years. And this government chose and took a decision not to write off that amount, but to give the National Insurance Scheme bonds for the full $457.5 million because we didn't feel that the government of Barbados should be allowed to be able to default for the monies that it took on trust for employees to put in there for the employees' funds. So I think that the time has come for us to remind the country of a few basic facts. And that amount continued, therefore, you don't issue bonds unless somebody gives you money. But in this case, it was not cash that the NAS gave us, it was the monies that the government and the SOEs owed NIS that led to those bonds. In addition, during the course of COVID, as you know, unemployment benefits <coughs> were significantly <coughs> drawn upon. And in those circumstances, it meant that when the numbers for persons not working went over 40,000 people, we knew that the unemployment benefit fund would be in trouble. And in spite of that, we stayed the course with it. We told the IMF, as we did members of the social partnership, that we would seek to reduce the amount of, of, of burden on the unemployment benefit fund by recapitalizing it, and that we would do it over five years. My friends, we did it in two. And we put $143 million in two years back into the unemployment benefit fund to keep it buoyant so that any of you who are Today, claiming unemployment benefit, do not have to worry about whether the fund can satisfy your needs or not. We have made it clear that the NIS fund is not in crisis, but what we are doing is taking preemptive action to ensure that there is no crisis, because this country, and indeed the tens of thousands of families who depend on this fund, cannot take that kind of pressure as we go forward. And I want to give us context because, you know, very often we forget context. When the National Insurance Scheme was found, funded, founded in 1967, does anybody know what the average age of Bajans was? The average age of Bajans was 20 years old. <laughs> Today, the average age of a Barbadian is over 40. And we already know that we have a declining and aging population. When the NIS was funded, was, was formed, sir, and founded, we had a situation where the country was growing at 7%. In the last decade, when we inherited, the country grew at just about half of 1%. And we believe that even those numbers were not necessarily capturing everything. And in recent times, we have tried to be able to set ourselves a clear target of at least 3 to 4% growth going forward. Now, those two things, therefore, affect both the growth of the fund, the population, the numbers of people working, and the situation was that in 2007, the actuaries modeled 
and predicted that we would have 30,000 more contributors than we are actually currently having now. The reality is that not only has that not happened, we have a graph here that I've shared with members of the press that is so telling, that tells us, for example, that of the people who are drawing pension for the first time in the year 2000, 52% of them, my friends, are still living. And I'd like the members of the media to carry the graph for you, because what does that really mean? You drew pension in the year 2000 at 65. At 65, when you are drawing pension, and you're still living today, it means that 23 years later, you're 88 years old. So that one in every two Barbadians who was living and over the age of 65 in the year 2000 is still living today. Now, if people are living at that rate to 88, it is a great and marvelous and wonderful thing because that's what we set out as an independent country to be able to do, to make sure that people can live as long as possible. The life expectancy when the fund was founded in 1967 was about 67, 68 years old. They tell me that today, the official figures for life expectancy are 77 for men, 76 point something, just under 77 for men, and just over 80 for women, bringing us in the vicinity of roughly about 78 as an average age for the average Barbadian. I have just told you that the National Insurance Scheme is paying out money to 50% of the Barbadians who went to draw it in the year 2000, and they're now 88 years old, and I hope that they live to a century. But if we want that, we have to be able to make the adjustments at the other end. And what are the options that you could have to make adjustments? And, and, and this is it. Some say, increase the contribution rates. Well, if you increase the contribution rates, my friends, it then means that you'll make businesses more uncompetitive because it has to come from somewhere. It means that you'll make self-employed people have to do, go deeper in their pockets. And that may hurt them in terms of what they're doing with respect to their own business, money taken away from retooling, you need a new piece of equipment, you need to pay the bank, you need all kinds of things. And employees, you have to pay a little more upfront going forward. But the impact on future growth is what and where it will hurt us the most. Secondly, people said, compliance, well of course, of course we need to deal with compliance. And I want to deal with compliance across this country. A small society means that everybody knows one another. And the first thing you hear is, could dare give so-and-so a chance? Could dare help out so-and-so? Whether it is in education, whether it is in payment of monies, whether it is in payment of taxes, whether it is in the payment of anything, whether it's compliance for anything, regulatory requirements. As a professional, you don't pay. They say, but how you can stop the man from earning a living? Because in a small society, everybody knows people, and it becomes difficult to be able to ensure compliance. Having said that, we have made it absolutely clear that there must be some red lines in the sand. And the red line in the sand with respect to this, this government has said, look, we know it's difficult to go to the bank and borrow money. We know that the bank will tie you up for six months and still possibly may not lend you the money. Credit union may tie you up for three months and tell no. But the reality is that the government said, forget all of that. Come forward and make arrangements with us. We know how hard it is to go, and we want you getting a blood pressure increase or a stroke. So you come, you go in bra, you go in NIS, and you make the arrangements. And we're going to recognize that there's something called cash flow peaks and valleys. And to that extent, so long as the trajectory, the path that you're following is in a situation where you're clearing your debt, even if you have some difficulties, come and talk with people. We're not ogres. My friends, that is what this government has done to be able to ensure that we can have a higher level of compliance. Now, the NIS still has the nuclear option of garnishing people's um, income, 
and it will continue to do that in circumstances where it is clear that the person with whom they're dealing is simply, simply not willing to comply under any circumstances and is only, as the Trinidadians would say, making as if. Making as if they want to pay, but when you look at the reality of payment, that's not there. So that when we looked at the issues, it was clear to us that the issues are structural. And my friends, structural means that we have to address them. The truth is that a time may come in the future when our economic growth, which is what we are working towards, can go even higher. And when we can bolster stability in respect of our population, where we may have to be able to say, how can we get more Bajans to come home? How can we get more people within the CSME to work from here and to contribute to the NAS, as was happening before there was the grand exodus back to Guyana and the Eastern Caribbean that was precipitated in 2008 by the last government. If these things happen, then a future government will have the honor and privilege of doing what I have not had the honor and privilege of doing, of being able to say to you, we have done well, we can actually roll back the retirement age in circumstances where other countries, for example, have carried them up, and when they reach good points, they've been able to roll it back down. But this is not something that can happen next year or the next three years. You need to be able to look at every actuarial report from now on, 2023, 2026, 2029, 2032, and see that as a medical checkup. The same way you go to the doctor to check your blood pressure and to check your blood sugar, you're gonna to have to go to the actuary. And when the actuary says, I'm seeing a different, how many of us have gone to the doctor and the doctor tell you that your pressure up and that the want you take some tablets or your cholesterol up and they want you to take some tablets as a precautionary measure and you then say to them, man, doc, 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 I know the one of the people that you're looking at in here did it. Man, doc, 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 I can, I can take this under control. I can eat different and I'm going to start to exercise. And in less than six months, my friend, you didn't come back good. And that is all will happen with us. The timelines will be different because you need a broader timeline in order to see truly a different trajectory. So when we come to you and say we're going to have to look at managed migration in terms of one, bringing back the agents first, but also having other people with skills, no different from Mr. Barr did in 1972. And he did that with the Immigration Act then when the average age in the country was just over 20. So imagine all the more necessary, and he did it by putting in the current Immigration Act that if you were bringing skills here, or if you had investment to make here, that you would be able to get immigrant status. Now, nobody talks about immigrant status anymore, and that's why we have to modernize our legislation. I make these points, my friend, because the truth is, and I made some notes today, because the truth is, that this country must be given the facts and the appropriate context because we've come too far, too far for us to cause anybody using the country as a platform for political elevation or for union um, expansion in order to put the country at risk. And I'm asking Barbadians to continue to trust this government because in everything that we have done, we have been upfront. This government was not the one making the investment in Four Seasons, Paradise. It was not the government making the investment in Apes Hill. But let me address even the Paradise One, because a lot of fanciful figures have been flying about. And in defense of the last government, the amount that was advanced was 9.2 million. And worse than that, the money has been repaid. Now there may be other investments that you have to look at, and part of the difficulty was, was that we put all of our eggs in one basket. Now, God forbid, and let me not enough, 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 enough wood, that Barbados get hit by a hurricane. All of the investments that the NIS has in Barbados will all of a sudden be compromised, not gone, but would be challenged because we don't know what the scale of the hurricane would leave, the scale of the damage that the hurricane would leave. And that is why the old time people tell, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Put some there, put some there. And right now, 80% of the NIS's portfolio, I'm told, is in Barbados, with 65% being in government. 
Now, government has actually been nefarious to them by being able to recapitalize the unemployment benefit fund, by taking the arrears that was owed by the last government and giving them Series B bonds, and by committing, as we did at the outset, to both Central Bank and NIS, that over the course of the next decade or two, when growth comes to the country from our commitment to restructure, we will continue to stabilize and under, uh, underwrite um, by putting back equity into both institutions. And I'd ask Bajans to please, please allow us to be able to do as we can as we grow, because as we all do, we were told that many hands make light work. We were told that a little with content is great gain. What all of those things tell you is the theory of gradualism. Gradualism. But if you have to come and some, do something sudden, it is as if you're jumping off of a precipice. Now, I want to remind us that in addition to all of that, when people say repay the $1.3 billion that I've just told you how we are dealing with it, that they forget that that action of haircut on the central bank and the NIS debt was critical to save our dollar. And without that, it would have meant that the country would have no reserves. And without reserves, how you're going to pay for oil and fuel? How you're going to pay for groceries that you import because we don't produce most of our food? How you're going to pay for all of the other necessities? Hindsight, <laughs> my friends, is 2020. And what has happened is that the patient is feeling so well that we forget what caught put us in the ICU in the first place and may put us back there again. So I ask Barbadians, please, let us ask, who would repay it? The workers, through increased contribution rates, the taxpayers, increased taxes. How are we going to do it? The money has to come from somewhere. There is no fairy godfather or fairy godmother. And all those who want us to put a tax to have it paid back, please put up your hands and let me count you now and see how we can build what you want us to do. When all that is required of us is to make adjustments in the circumstances that we have indicated that will go over a period of time. Similarly, that we don't put all our eggs in one basket because at the end of the day, we have to be able to ensure that if the worst hits us, they still have some revenue coming in. And that is why the central bank has given the NIS permission again to be able to take back up external investments. I am deeply saddened that someone who sat in a cabinet that underwent and that presided over the management of the first NIS reform would seek now to ask the question, where the 80 million gone from or who take up the 80 million? as if we're talking about somebody tiefing money from a rum shop or a shop in Bridgetown. This is foolishness. And we know better. Because when the NIS takes up money to invest, they have investment guidelines. They can invest in U.S. treasuries. And more often than not, they will be restricted to investing in what they call, I think they call it blue chip companies with the equities. So that to suggest that the money may go overseas and find its way back here in a circuitous route, as we heard, to go into a pet project of a politician is errant nonsense and ought to be rubbished immediately as it came out the mouth of the person spewing it. I want my friends to remind us that not only have we done that, but we asked the NIS board through the government directors to be able to ensure that there are new investment guidelines put in place. And I've also asked the Minister of Labor to be very clear in exposing what the investments are that the NIS has made over the years. Since this government has come to power and to office, we have had what? The fire station that is being built. The NIS owns buildings that the government has been paying them for on time every month, given the NIS its rate of return that it requires. The same thing will happen with the fire station. The NIS has taken investments, I think, in one or two other 
um, thing. We don't even know. I have never given an instruction for the NIS to be able to invest in any private company in this country, not one. So that I want, please, to put these things on the way, on the side, and we await the new investment guidelines of the fund as we go forward. My friends, this matter of age and the things that we are doing. Barbados is not the only country facing social security reform and NIS reform. I want you to carry the stories out of Grenada. I want you to carry the stories out of Trinidad. I want you to go and investigate what is the situation in the Bahamas and what they are facing. I want you to go to the UK, but I can help you there. In the UK, the current plans were to increase the state pension age of 66 to 67 in a phase introduction between 2026 and 2028. We saw the same thing in Paris. But in the UK, they also had a plan to take it to 68 between 2044 and 2046. They have since, in March this year, come back and announced that the decision to bring forward the date for state pensions to 68 will be postponed until after the next general election. I am not playing politics with the ages, though. And others who need to can do so. But that is not an example that we want to follow. I have told the country today and before, if we can have the level of growth that we want to have, and if we can bolster and increase our population, those are the two surest ways that a future government will get to do that which this government cannot do because of what it inherited. And if there's any ambiguity about that, I am happy to clear it up in the questions. But let us look at the options. We have decided that 65 in 2003 was to move to 67 as a country. And we did that seamlessly over a period of time. The reality is that we have also decided now that the retirement age, which is 67, not 65 as being promoted by some people out there. It is 67 today that you will not go and it will not go to 67 and a half until the year 2028. Not 2024, not 2025, not 2026, not 2027. 2028 is when it goes to 67 and a half. And then you wait another six years until 2034. Now, why did this government do that? Because if we can get to world class by 2030, there would be no reason to go to 68 then. And if we can get to world class by 2030, you might even be able to bring it back down to 67. Or even lower, depending on the scale of growth and the strength of our population. And this is the deal. How many of us got children and say you want to go outside? You can't go outside until you play, to play until you finish your homework and until you finish your chores. Why? Because you're building the well-being of the house, the welfare of the house, and the individual well-being of the child. Now, the country is not a child, but the metaphor is similar. Because if we can get the economic growth in the next seven years, and if we can get the stability in the population rising, as the Population Commission is advising us that we need to do, looking at, at, at stabilizing over now and 2050, not, a, not like Germany. Germany went for one million people, one million people from the Middle East. In Germany, <coughs> all at once, boom, shot of adrenaline. Now, I'm conscious that if we were ever to do that here, it might be too disruptive for the population particularly because it is on a smaller land size. So we are choosing to do it between now and 2050, 27 years. But we do need to see the signs of success in order to be able to make any further adjustments. The other key point is this. 
Anybody who is 60 or over today, that age doesn't apply to them. They're not the ones who are going to be affected by 2028 to go to 60, 67 and a half. So that I want the scaremongering, the fear mongering to stop. And it is going to become like the boy who cried wolf. Because when you really have something to complain about that has merit, nobody's going to be listening to you because you are continually promoting things on the basis of fake news or a false platform. I don't want to be the only one speaking to this. My director of finance and economic affairs, Ian Carrington, was the director of national insurance. I want you all to seek out Mr. Carrington even after this press conference and go and talk to him about the 457 million in bonds and arrears. Go and talk to him to break down any of these things. There are very few people in this country who know Social Security better than he is. In fact, in the Caribbean, because of the length of time he served in that capacity, and also because of the continuous education and training that he did while being there. And I want, therefore, to say that when we talk about these things, we need context again. So no 67 and a half until when? 2028, five years from now. And no 68 until 2034. And if the country can do well with growth and with population growth, not just economic growth, then we may be able to pull it back and I will be there watching on God's spare life to be able to help in that exercise from an outsider position. At the same time, when we talk about pensions, we've said that do not apply it immediately to those who are over 60 and that the first time that we should be looking to do that would be for those who are under 60 now, but who will draw pension after 2028. And they then would have the applicable pension age. So even as we are raising the age, we say that the people who are on the front line, the people who are between 60 and 67 now, stand down, this don't apply to you. How much fairer can a government be than that? How much fairer can a government be than that? My friends, what is the pension in Barbados? I gave you another document that I would want you, please, to share with the people of this country. Because in those documents, you will see for the entire region, the entire region, a spreadsheet from Anguilla, Antigua, Barbuda, Bahamas, Barbados, Belize, BVI, Dominica, Grenada, Guyana, Montserrat, St. Kitts, Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Turks and Caicos, Trinidad and Tobago. Barbados pays the highest pension in the region by far. By far. 526 US dollars is the equivalent of 1,052 Barbados dollars. The closest one to that is Trinidad that pays 450 US or 900 Barbados dollars. So Barbados pays 152 dollars more in pension than Trinidad. But the average in the region, look at this, is below 150 dollars. Look at it, 300 Barbados dollars. So Barbados is get their Bajans, get. 752 Barbados dollars more every month than the average pensioner in the Caribbean. And when you whether you like it or not, even if inflation is a little higher, it is not that much higher in Barbados than the rest of the Caribbean to bridge that gap. So that the purchasing power of a Barbadian pensioner is significantly more than the purchasing power of a pensioner in any other part of the region. At the same time, let's look. Let's look at what is happening 
The British Virgin Islands, you know that is not an independent country, correct? And the pension there is 260 US, $520. In Turks and Caicos, it is 405 US. And look at the reality in terms of all of the other indices. The next issue was carrying the contributions from 500 to 750. What is 500 contributions, anybody? That's 10 years. What is 750 contributions? That's 15 years. Tell me on average how long the average man or woman working in Barbados. 10 years? 15 years? So we're we getting and tying up ourselves in the knot for, on this. When the average person can work 25, 30, 40 years. And all we're asking you to do is don't say that you could draw a pension after 10 years of work or benefits, but draw it after 15 years. That can't be unreasonable. This is the country of fairness. This is the country where everybody tell, man, you got to be fair. you got to be reasonable. But this is the test of fairness and this is the test of reasonableness. And what is more, it doesn't start to kick in until 2031 for people who are over the age of 60. Because we know that, okay, you didn't get advance notice. So if you are 60 years or over, the 750 contribution threshold will not apply to anybody until the year 2031. So for that person in 2031 to be 67 and a half, how old would they have to be today? Eight years, 2023 to 2031. Eight years from 67 and a half, 59 and a half. It does not apply to anybody 60 years or over. I'm begging the media to get the facts to people, just as we are trying to do the public education. This country cannot be about who is loudest, who is most sensational, who is most dramatic. If I want entertainment, I will go and look for entertainment on Instagram and on social media. I will go and look for some old Trevor Eastman and some old Matt Fingal. But this country cannot have people making entertainment with the reality of people's pensions. And if you want to do it, then be prepared to be answered frontally. So what have been the options, my friends? Do nothing and let the NIS collapse. Significantly increase the contributions, as I said, which we were not prepared to do because we are already among the highest in the region in terms of contribution rate. Look at the same document. Barbados is the highest in the region. We have the highest rates, but we by far have the highest pensions. Reduce the pension benefit. Oh, Lord. Now you would have really heard murder in the country. Murder, murder, murder in the market. Raise it by a year, as we have done, over an 11-year period, <clears throat> with the first increase coming in five years' time, and the second one, six years after, to give the country a chance to be able to grow, to give the child a chance to grow, to give us a chance to become world class and to have the growth. <clears throat> or significantly increase the number of payments <clears throat> that working people must make to qualify. Not prepared to do that. I remind you, one in every two Bajans, 52%, who start drawing pension in the year 2000 are still living. And those figures are more accurate than even the life expectancy from the statistical service, which is an average. And all of this on top of generous state benefits. A grandmother, if we were not paying children's school fees in Barbados for them to go to school free, if we were not providing textbooks free at secondary level, if we were not introducing, as we just did last week, the $100 primary school textbook grant, and I hope that Bajans understand that that will take place. They'll go to the schools when school reopens, 
and the ministry will outline the process for each child's parent or guardian to be able to get that hundred dollars. If we were not doing any of those things, what would happen to that grandmother or grandfather? If the parent struggling or ain't working, that grandmother would go and take money out of the pension to go and buy school books for the child. If we were not providing free health care at the polyclinics and at the hospital and how much ever people complain about it, what they get here is far more in terms of health benefits than most other countries in the region. That grandparent or that pensioner, even for themselves or their children, would have to go and look for money to pay doctors or drug service. 65 years and over, you draw for free pharmaceuticals. 16 and under, same thing. And for certain chronic NCDs. And all of this the government is paying for year in and year out. Let us get real. And remember context, please. And let us remember that without context, we will not get there. We have had the awful news that our thing has actually, our population has actually declined. 269,090, I think it is. 269,000 and change. No, 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 we're going the wrong way. Early retirement. I want to remind people that when people, I want to retire early. Well, when you retire early, not now, always. There is a penalty for early retirement at NAS. It is start now. You lose half of 1% for every month that you retire early. So if you choose to retire now with the retirement age at 67, and you choose to retire at 60, you lose 6 times 7 is how much? 6% a year because half of 1% times 12 is 6%. 60 to 67 is 7 years. 6 times 7, again back to primary school now, 42. So you lose 42%. Now a lot of people who tell man I can retire early, they don't got the courage to come and tell me, you know when I retire early, <laughs> I get a big rock because I, I lose 42% of my pension. This government is start that. That has always been the case. Similarly, if you retire later than 67 and start to draw the pension later than 67, you can in fact consolidate what you draw. So that it is no different from what we deal with with day-to-day -day life. You put in, you get out. You don't put in, you don't get out. Let us go. And on this matter of political pensions, I thank Colin Jordan when he was on a call-in program here the other day that he made public my own position. I feel it should be increased from 50. But the reality is that we have a parliamentary reform commission that we established. And part and parcel of its remit is to look at the terms and conditions as well. And as much as people hate politicians, without a good government, you can't get those benefits that I just talked about. So don't join everyone else in cursing governments just so when the experience of Bajans and government has been considerably different from a lot of countries in the world. Because the benefits that Barbadians get in this country from successive administrations, successive, even the last one that put us in trouble, they did a lot of foolishness, but there were one or two good things that they would have done. They let the unemployment benefit go for six months instead of, um, for a year, sorry, instead of six months when you had the 2008, 2009 crisis. You remember when Mr. Thompson did that? So that they didn't do all bad. But the reality is that we have this belief in this country that every politician and every government now is to be accused of the worst things in the world without recognizing that it is the same governments that allow a lot of people to be able to stand in this country that would not otherwise be able to stand. That doesn't mean there's perfection. But let me give you the facts. Even as I say it should go up, the reality is that there are some differences. And what are those differences? A politician, a member of parliament, contributes to their pension. And I think the figure is 17.5%, okay? Um, so, or 17.1%, just like a self-employed person. But we can't draw sickness benefit. We don't draw invalidity benefit. We don't draw um, all of those severance payments. 
if a minister is fired tomorrow, they don't get to go before the Employment Rights Tribunal. And they are as safe as whenever the Prime Minister decides to call an election, which may be any time within a five-year and 90-day period. They have no similar benefits like the others. In addition to that, when they pay this contribution, they have and will be on their own. Now, there are some politicians who will be in the NIS from their substantive profession or job. You didn't grow up in Parliament. So that many would have worked paying their contributions for an NIS pension, and that is where you compare apple with apple. But for them as a species within Parliament, that is like comparing apples with bananas. One red, one yellow. One wrong, one long and oblong. So that we are not comparing the two. But even with that, because the life expectancy has increased, I believe that that age, and let me deal with those who walked about shamefully representing that the age of 50 is what this government did. Oh, politicians, they got politicians paying at 50. I'm going to pay in at 67. I'm going to retire at 67. They got politicians retiring at 50. That retirement date, my friends, was set in March 1969. I was not even four years old yet. Indeed, I was three and a half years exactly a toddler. But as a woman with gray hair now, you would understand how long that retirement date was set for politicians. And I believe, just as I've said with the Parliamentary Reform Commission, we have not substantially reviewed our parliament in half a century, 50 years, that we should be given the chance to be able to do it. So I look forward to that one. There are, however, certain categories of workers who I believe and we've said this all along, as has the Attorney General, that need a look in. And that we believe, for example, a soldier, and rightly so, gets to retire early once he's under the rank of lieutenant at 45 years old. But a police constable who could be made to be fairly active, because that's the nature of a constable's job for the most part, unless they're specifically doing a desk job, has to wait till 67. There are other categories of agricultural workers or weeders, people who clean in and weed in the road, who may have to go to 67 too. And the government has agreed that we will appoint a committee to look at those categories of workers for whom early retirement in a fair way ought to be a consideration. Owen Arthur and Ralph Gonzalez were famous for quoting Aristotle, equality among equals and proportionality amongst unequals. And I share that because what did I say? If you're not apples and apples, it can't be equality. And if you are apples and bananas, it got to be what is proportionate, what is fair and proportionate. And I ask the public, therefore, to let us go into this process of having that committee review those categories of jobs. I imagine it will take probably about three, four months, but that committee will be announced shortly, and that process will take some time. And indeed, I know that the AG has already spoken, for example, to the head of the police association and others, so this is nothing that we are spewing out this morning to you. I've also said that as we go there, that we want Barbadians, as I said, to recognize that the transition of the NIS department is something, in our view, that is critical. If the Public Service Commission, as has happened in the past, can move the head of IT from the NIS on a Friday evening to go and work in the Treasury on a Monday morning, where does that leave the NIS and its sending out of pension checks or doing calculations in the IT? You cannot have a department with a fund of $4.5 billion or whatever it is now, with a tripartite board, social partners represented fully, private sector, union movement, and government, and treat to it as a government department. It needs to have its own independence and its own identity, no different from the Central Bank of Barbados. And part of the benefit of it is, is that it can also pay people better according to the weight and the work that they're doing. 
And I fully anticipate, and just as the Deputy Chairman, um, Mr. Rodden Adams, has been leading the effort on the pension reform and the benefits reform, the Chairman, Mr. Leslie Haynes, has been leading the effort on the transition of the board to, um, of the NAS to a independent entity. And the conversations and all of the preparatory work with the director, Ms. Tudor, as well as <coughs> others, have um, been going on at a pace that we are satisfied will soon come to an end. The reality is that people will have the option of whether they want to go into that arrangement or whether they want to stay in central government. And central government will then have to determine whether places can be found for them or not. If not, other arrangements then kick in. My friends, the NIS accounts. I spoke to this in Parliament here recently the other day, and I believe that the accounts are up to date at least to 2015 now. But what was the problem is that they were using IFRS, which is an international accounting standard, that was really not appropriate, and that they needed to be able to modify those standards in order to be able to deal with it. I made the point that Barbados moved to accrual accounting without being ready for it. And what does that mean? From cash to accrual, accrual simply means that I've got to register every liability. Even the ones that I sometimes don't even know about, it forces me to do, which means that you will always be in no man's land from when a man moves from two employees to 12 employees. And you can't therefore be able to properly assess. The government has said, modify the standards. And whether it's IFRS or IPAS, modify the standards to suit us and let people get the accounts audited because this is not a case to our best of knowledge of anybody thiefing money or any improprieties. This has to do with the fact that we have not been able to settle these for some time. So I hope that this puts to bed most of these issues pertaining to NIS. With respect to the transition of other state-owned enterprises, and this is why I say that I understand the fatigue, you know, I understand that, 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 that you feel you're tired, but Shade can say she's tired when she come into the straight before the line. She got to cross the finish line. And Barbados has to cross the finish line, which for us must be using the next seven years to become world class. If we don't do that, we will always be looking back and getting ready to fall down. So that we need to be able to stay the course. And what does that mean? We knew from 9, 2018. Remember the survey we did? As to which state-owned enterprises will stay and which will go? 5,000 Bajans participated. If that were to happen in the US, 5 million people would be participating up there. You understand the extraordinary level of participation in this country? But what happened? As soon as we finished paying back the debt in December 2019, boops, 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 COVID. When COVID comes, how are you going to restructure the transport board in COVID when the only thing you can do for the transport board in COVID is to reduce the number of passengers per the bus and hence reduce its revenue and increase the money that government has to give it because we didn't send home a single person during COVID at transport board. How are you going to deal with BAMC and the agricultural workers and restructure that and give them the opportunities to own companies and to have the conversations with them to show them why ownership is a critical part of them taking over and us restructuring the sugar industry and not putting the hundreds of millions of dollars that we have put in it, even in the last, you got to figure here, I'm sure, that, 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 that um, on the sugar industry in the last 50 years, we have been moving, moving, moving and putting monies in the sugar industry year after year. And we said enough is enough. We are going to use the transition to energy as a way to stabilize the sugar industry. Indeed, I believe only in the last 22, 23 years, and I'll confirm the number for you after this thing, we have put over almost $600 million in the sugar industry alone. How are you going to restructure that industry in the middle of COVID? So all of that restarted in January this year. Transport Board, the Mass Transit Authority, Mr. Ed Bushell, I want to thank him, is chairing the committee that has on a number of key skills legal, financial, HR, and is working with the unions to be able to see how we can create a mass transit authority because the last government effectively privatized transport when it moved the number of PSV licenses held by private people
from 350 to over 750. <laughs> and they didn't buy a bus. And they weren't buying any parts to repair the bus. And they left UCAL with $22 million in debt. But yet UCAL was to repair the buses. So that what we inherited was effectively already a largely privatized system. We chose to buy 49 electric buses straight off. We just got another 10, and we will be looking to buy some more as we go forward, as long as the cash flow and the debt space allows it. Why? Because the country needs it. But as we do that, we are stepping back from the transport board and seeking to create a mass transit authority that will facilitate the proper regulation of all of these private vehicles to be able to help Barbadians get to work on time and to drive and to be safe on public transport. The Gaia Inc., the minister made a ministerial statement on that, and you know where that is going. In fact, only last night they received preliminary drawings of the capital works that would be done at the airport, and we have now to meet with them to make sure it meets our needs. But the truth is that it is very impressive, and I look forward to seeing what will happen to our airport in the next few years. So my friends, I'm dealing with record and not rhetoric. And these conversations that will continue to happen will update you. I am a little disappointed that sometimes I hear some members, for example, of the NUPW telling us that they have not learned or they have not heard. The NUPW sits on the NIS board. Not now, for decades. Just as the BWU does. And I respect the rights of unions to consult with their members. But we must also let the public know that they have been part of this process going forward. And similarly with respect to Gaia Inc., the Board of Gaia Inc. met with all of the unions before anything was made public. A double L, all. And I just told you what was happening at Transport Board. And I can tell you the same thing. Now, let us be clear. A government that <laughs> gives public servants a 5% increase as soon as it comes to office while going into an IMF program a government that appoints over 3,000 public servants in the middle of a pandemic, October 2020, who have been acting in positions when the government already is stressed to be able to carry everybody else. And I forgot to mention the business interruption benefit for NAS that we introduced when the pandemic came that would make all self-employed people and new rules. Colin will announce the new rules for self-employed, the new flexibility for self-employed people, the fact that we want to get rid of that rigidity and when a man got money in his pocket and can put in a little something, go and pay so that you're not in any way constrained from when you don't have money and being made to do equal payments and all of that. Completely different set of things. Excuse me for my sinuses, please. So that when all of those things happen, we have said, look, let us get ahead of the curve and let us move forward to make sure that we can put all of these things in context. I would wish that we could sequence them one after the other, after the other, after the other. But the last government didn't give us that luxury by leaving us where they left us. And unless we get this right, we are going to have problems going forward with respect to the stability and the growth of this country. I want to deal now, as I said, with the fact that we hope that the unions will therefore engage with us in good faith going forward. The other one is the UDC, RDC, which will be integrated into a National Development Commission and that effectively will allow us to be able to rationalize properly a lot of the administrative and, 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 and top line expenses as we go forward. Um, let me move to the Integrity Commission. The journey to an Integrity Commission has almost been torturous in this country and it has taken more than four decades. I want to thank everyone 
in parliament, outside of parliament, in government, outside of government, who have allowed us now to make this move. But I want to set out for the country what is the reality of that move. The truth is that when the bill is proclaimed, it becomes, when the act is proclaimed, it becomes law immediately. But there has to be a set of people there to whom people can submit their declarations and who can supervise. So it means that we have to be able to establish the commission. And I have some notes here that I'll share with you if you want. Um, I won't spend time talking on them. Sets out what the board looks like. Um, the chairman, a judge of, of a court having unlimited jurisdiction in civil and criminal matters. That does mean a, a, a high court judge. Um, and that person, and then you go down to people who have an attorney at law, a chartered accountant, a member of the clergy, um, and persons appointed individually, one by me, and one if there was a leader of the opposition. In the absence of the leader of the opposition, is the president. Okay? Um, but these people have to be appointed. Even when these people are appointed, that's not the end of it, because we need a staff. But staff can only function, structure, now must follow the functions of the entity. And we have to decide what are those posts that would be needed to run this commission. We then have to go and advertise for those posts. And we then have to let them come in and run and set up all the rules and all of the ways of operation. So I'm carrying you through this process so that the media, you won't ask me in three months or six months time what has happened. Because this is a step-by-step -step process. And once that is done, then you have to have, and this is where I'm going to be adamant, a comprehensive period of public education. Because you are changing how a number of people have to operate in this country. From public servants, senior public servants, to the political class, to the new judges, to the... Um, chairman of boards and we believe that if you're going to be faithful to ensuring that people don't run away and regrettably some board chairman have already said to me I don't know if I want to serve I said no just cool your herbs cool your herbs cool it because when you start to understand what is required and the length of time and the public education believe you me we are going to do this in a way that makes it sustainable and does not make a mockery of it. But in the meantime, this government didn't stop there. Before the Integrity Act, what did you all report that Parliament passed? May I remind you? The Prevention of Corruption Act. The old one was 1925. This government changed it. The Anti-Corruption and Anti-Terrorism Act. The Public Procurement Act. The Public Finance Management Act. And the Public Procurement Act is now, has not yet been um, proclaimed, but that will soon be. The Proceeds and Instrumentalities of Crime Act and the Whistleblower Protection Act. So that without having the Integrity Act, we have strengthened the legislative framework to fight corruption in this country because the cancer of corruption that we inherited was bad. But the reality in a small state, again, I spoke to small state realities just now, is that people don't want to be able to hear that, oh, they've got to come forward and make a statement. They can tell you and me outside. But when you tell them, go and give a statement to the police, what does do? Well, you all know it all the time. You don't, you don't go, go into government to find out or talk about corruption to find out. And that is always the difficulty. And that is why we've had to pass other pieces of legislation to strengthen the powers of investigation. And in addition to that, as you know, we established an anti-corruption authority that is headed by the former Commissioner of Police, Mr. Darwin Dotton. So my friends, um, we also have to provide for the funding, but that will follow whatever structures are put in place and staff put in place in there. So I'm glad that you will have that and that that will bring a good level of comfort to all in this country that we are serious about doing this in a sustainable way and not in an ad hoc manner. And to the last point, perhaps, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I just want to say this, and this relates to the old Savoy 
or savvy as some have called it. The government has been negotiating for quite a few weeks. I, I don't say months because months may take six months, but it would probably be closer to two to three months. Through the Attorney General and the Senior Minister of Infrastructure, William Dugit, Dr. Dugit. What disturbed me is that the first thing we agreed at everyone's request was that we didn't go into the media to negotiate. Well, I don't need to tell you what has happened. And that persons related to the developer have continued to talk. And you may ask, why hasn't the government defended itself? Well, because we live by certain principles. But what I will say to you now is that I have said to the two gentlemen, you have a timeline on these negotiations. And if these negotiations don't finish within the next few weeks, there must be a ministerial statement to the parliament. And all of the facts laid bare, including how this matter started under the last government, why there was a need to go to court under the last government, how therefore the sale was proceeded with as a result of an act of specific form performance, and why we would not have been able to act before when we said from the very beginning to larboard, from larboard to starboard, from the last, certainly from the time I was a child, those two lots in the middle were always car parks. In fact, there used to be a jetty there for those who are old enough to remember. And that we believe that the public of Barbados must retain that open space to the speech, to the beach, and that there must be the opportunity for Bajans to go and park the car and get a sea bath when they want, as they have always been able to do. Now, the only thing that I will say about this is that the issue on preying upon small vendors has been put at the center of it. I want to be very clear. Regardless of the outcome of the discussions with the developer, those vendors will stay where they are. And I say so because the information coming to government from the developer would suggest that they only have a lease until March or May next year. I can't remember. One of those two. And I want to give you the assurance that the difficulty as to where you are on the beach is not the developer's land. And therefore, whether it is the developer who eventually leases the land or it remains with government as it is currently, you will have the opportunity to stay there. I thank the developer for giving us the idea, even though there was no application to town planning and no ownership of the land on which he has put you but you will stay there. Thanks be to God. I will say no more on that at this stage. So my friends, I have come today to clear up a number of issues and will do so periodically. But what I will not do is to put this country ever at risk because we have come too far. And while I understand that people are tired and that people want the true differences. The truth is that we can't. And that's why we're reforming education. That's why transforming education, I hope, not reforming. And, and the public will be brought into that discussion within a few weeks. That is why we've started with welfare reform, with the One Family Initiative and all of the other things that we're doing to make the delivery of social services people-centered and not about this agency that's delivering it. That's why we've started criminal justice reform. That's why we are undertaking digital reform with the digital ID and the digital payments in the economy. All of these things, and I can go on to the other areas of reform, planning and development reform with town planning. We're literally having to reform on too many fronts, not because we want work, not because we don't want to be able to do things sequentially, but because the hole in which we were found is so deep that if we don't walk and chew, and if we don't stay the course, and if we don't continue when the burning kicks in, like when you're exercising, you will not make the goal. So I hope that I've been able to contextualize this. I know I've spoken long, and I'm sure that the media can therefore parse it and bring it in different spaces. 
to be able to be in bite-sized chunks for you. But I believe that it is important, as I've always done, to come to you with the facts and to be able to have you understand context so that you can commit to mission transformation. We came in and we dealt with mission critical. When we thought we could move to mission transformation, boom, COVID had to do with mission survival. And for the most part, we are on mission transformation, but there may be some survival issues, particularly not of our own making, like the inflationary pressures from the supply disruption and the increase in oil prices, like the COVID. But we will deal with them, but keep our eyes forever gazed on the goalposts of mission transformation. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Prime Minister. Um, gonna go back to pension. Sorry, go, I know who you are. Ryan. Yes, please, Ryan Broom, Ryan Broom, CBC. Thank you. Um, just want to go back to the pensions. In addition to all that you mentioned, uh, you, you mentioned that the, the we have a what is a really sharp population decline. Um, any uh, consideration to, to going back to well, a church? declining and aging population. Yes, that's why one in every two is at 88 years old that started claiming pensions in 2000. So declining, but aging. Yes. A any consideration to including in the different measures a, a return to the child allowance that we, that we once had in terms of the tax incentives uh, to encourage people to, to you know, we, not, we don't get six and seven or 10 <laughs> anymore, but- yeah, um, People like me, they help me matter. <laughs> um, the truth is that we will look at all things when we come to the immigration reform and the demographics reform to see what can be done on the medium term to promote that. But you would appreciate that even if we gave that now, that can't help the country in the next 25 years because it will take that long for that child to become productive. So that the country can't pause development for 25 years. So that's why we say to Bajans, come home. Mm -hmm. And that's why we say to people who will have skills and investment to, make, to help us build up this country, come long. Because if we don't do it, we are going to find ourselves truly falling away. The old time falling away and not being able to lift the weight of development that the country requires of us. So all things are on the table in terms of boosting fertility rates, but the reality is that we have not replaced our population since 1980. I was still, um, I was in, four, I was what, still in secondary school in fourth form, I believe, in 1980. Mm. So you would understand how long this matter has been left idle and not being addressed. Okay, quickly before you, the mic. There's also been some, some murmurings on social media in relation to the Barbados Water Authority um, <laughs> and the possibility of, of, of privatization. Um, obviously, social media, the way it is, people will say what they, what they will, but what, what can you say, if anything, on this, on this issue? Look, this morning, because I got social media like anybody too, this morning I get, I got a message, a written piece from someone who wanted to run for the General Secretary of the Democratic Labour Party in the last few years. In fact, he ran against me last election. His name is on it, Kimar Stewart. Accusing the government, all Bajans need to focus now on the Barbados Water Authority, the privatization of the BWA and the raising of water rates happening soon in this country. To raise water rates will crush people. Now, first of all, I want to say categorically, there has been no such discussion of the raising of water rates. I want to also say there has been no such discussion about the privatization of the Barbados Water Authority. And when we have to raise rates, we have done it in 2019, you forget, with the commercial rates, mm -hmm. when the people who were um, paying commercial rates were not paying the same thing, in fact, as even households. But when you have this kind of speculation from persons who should know better, or the $80 million being sent out to who carry out the $80 million from the, from, from the central bank, or the people who tell us to go on sick leave but turn up to work doing their own matters. When you have these kinds of things, all you are doing, as we are seeing in the United States of America and in the UK, 
and in the rest of the region is diminishing the quality of our democracy. And the truth is that we have a strong democracy and, and there is no need for it. Last night I spoke at the launch of the cricket match about the blue tick. We need to have a blue tick on every piece of information, a fact check on every piece of information that is put out in this country now because people are playing fast and loose. And when they play fast and loose, it is intended to create scaring, scaremongering, fearmongering among the population so that it can propel some to political growth. Now, if you really want to be propelled to political growth, come and sit down and let me talk to you and tell you how to do it. But don't do it at the expense of Bajans. I beg you do. Especially this young man. I like him. I actually like him. And I want, therefore, to work with him and help him. It is true that he, he ran against me for one of the new parties. He then was a member of the Labour Party, and now he's a member of the Dems. So he's like a, a, a rolling stone that gathers no moss. But I don't want him to be heizing up, talking about things that ain't no reality, don't bear no relationship to reality. Uh, good afternoon, Prime Minister Barry Allen from The Nation newspaper. If you could indulge me with ask two questions uh, at the same time. The first one is, is your government willing to scrap the tax on pensions? There are complaints by Barbadians that they believe they're in many instances double taxed and that is not an incentive to want to go into no, a private pension no, plan. No, Barry, and Brian Strong has answered this already. And I have also answered today to explain how we are also helping pensioners across a range of other state benefits. We don't accept it, but we'll continue at this stage. When we can ease people, this government has done it always. And may I remind you what we have done with corporation taxes and income taxes. And corporation taxes will have to be addressed again, as I said, in the budget because of the global minimum corporate tax. And, and the impact that it will have on all of us in the region. It will just be taken by the countries that we don't tax, if we don't tax. With respect to income tax, what have we done, Barry? Thank you for asking me to remind the country. People who earn under $25,000, 2000 and change a month, are the very people who now benefit fully from the reverse tax credit. Before that, it was only people earning $1,500 a month. Secondly, People paying between, earning between 25000 and 35000 a year, between the same, just under 2100 a month, and just 3000 just under 3000 a month, will pay taxes, but they get it all back, so long as the government can afford, with its cash flow, and a compensatory income credit. Everybody else, including everybody in this room, got significant savings on income tax from this government in 2019, the year before the year before COVID, and we never took it back in spite of having to go through COVID. Everybody, and we have increased the tax allowance for pensioners by a little bit. If we can do it again, believe you me, we will do it. And if we can keep sparing Barbadians as we have done in order to allow people to save, we've had two salary increases for public servants in five years, and the last government gave you one in 10. I'm asking Bajans to bear with us, and I have committed to this country my life, and I have committed to this country to certain principles that the country must stand for. Share the burden, share the bounty. We are not in a position at this stage to do better. When we can, we shall. And second question, as you know, Prime Minister, pension reform is usually a, a very difficult pill to swallow. Mm -hmm. Your good friend, President Macron, can attest to that mm -hmm. in terms of widespread protest. We've now seen two sets of protests in Barbados to your pension reform. Having brought these numbers to the country today and the situation as it relates to Barbados, what would be your message to Barbadians now who would still be mindful to agitate on the streets regarding this particular uh, reform that well, your government has brought things. to you? I want Bajans first to get the facts and to stay the course with us. But for those who want to protest, I am the first person to tell you protest because a sign of protest is your right. And your right is your right in a democratic country. And if they march every week, it is the biggest confirmation that Barbados is truly a democratic state. So I don't mind, in fact I encourage them 
to march if they so desire, because that is their right in this country. But it does put the lie to all of their allegations that we are undemocratic and that people are demons and dictators. Uh, Prime Minister Marlon Madden, Barbados Today. I have a couple questions. I want to start first by asking what is being done in relation to governance of the NIS? That's one of the big issues that people are asking for. I think that I addressed it briefly there with the transitioning to the board and with, and I also mentioned to you the new investment guidelines that are coming down and we are trying to ensure that we strengthen the independent governance so that it appropriately functions as a tripartite body. I also told you that I have never, as Minister of Finance, given a direction for them to invest in any private sector company. And far from that, what we have done is try to stabilize them wherever we can by putting in the 143 million within two years rather than five. A key part of governance is also getting the audits completed. And as a result of meeting with the Director of Finance and the Auditor General, with the agreement that they look at modified standards, the board is now free to make those adjustments. And I would expect, therefore, that those audits would be finished in a hurry. Once the board transitions, once the NIS transitions to an independent entity, I would imagine that that independent entity also will continue to strengthen the governance framework in even more tangible ways than what I've just addressed. Also, you mentioned that you believed that the age by which politicians access pensions should go up. If you were to give the recommendation to the reform, the parliamentary reform, what would that age be likely? I don't want to predict, but I know it can be 50, and I know it can be little 50 neither. So I will wait for them to decide, but suffice it to say I'm not necessarily um, popular when I say this, but I believe it has to go up significantly. But it will not be the same, because remember what I said, equality among equals and proportionality among unequals. And, 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 and the mere fact that we're establishing a committee to look at other categories of workers is to be able to ensure that that principle of equality among equals, proportionality among unequals, is also reflected then in recommended ages for any special category of worker recognizing that the burden placed on them is extraordinary or different or there's a lack of security of tenure or different other things. Another area that you alluded to um, as it relates to the amount of contribution, that we, the amount that we get in pension as it relates to inflation, the BARP has also called, they're saying that they're operating on a starvation pension and government should do more. In the, for the um, through the NIS, I, I don't, I, Are, is there room I for any I didn't any hear anybody changes? Use that language, and if they did, I'm sorry that they did because I don't think that the highest pension in the region can be viewed as a starvation pension. You may say that you want more, you may say that you need more, but you can also you also have to sit down and account for all of the other benefits that you get through the state. And a child whose parent is only earning two thousand dollars a month may want to be able to buy the fanciest car toy tractor to be able to go and drive boat too. But if the parent buys that for them, they're not going to be able to feed them for a few months. So that let us be real and understand that we can only do what we can afford. I can say whatever I want. I don't have the luxury of doing that. I have to do what we must. And what we must is to be able to ensure that we take care of people for the long term and not the short term. So I'm sure that there are ways we can find and discuss with them to ease the burden of those who are suffering, and I'm prepared to do that. But what we can't do is just simply across the board increase things in a way that will undermine the very platform and foundation that we have. And I hope I've made that clear in this engagement today. Um, Madam Prime Minister, could you give us an idea the number? We're talking about um, one in two people since 20. Since 2000, who are still alive? What's the number? I don't have the absolute number, but on average, let me let me help you, and I can get the numbers from NAS for you. But on average, we were dealing with an age cohort of about 42, 4300 a year um, when I was Minister of Education 30 years ago. Um, as to whether that number is higher, it might well be. Because, as I said, we haven't replaced our population since 1980. 
What bothers me is that, as I said in Parliament, that the number of people being born now are about 24, 2500, 23, 24, 2500 a year. So look at the huge difference. And, and that is why um, we really, really, really are standing in the middle of a train track with a train coming at us hard, hard, hard. It doesn't only affect NAS, it doesn't only affect pension reform, it affects the capacity of this country to grow, it affects the number of people paying taxes, and indeed the quantum of taxes being paid. So beyond NIS and Social Security, that decline in numbers of working age, working age, will significantly impair this country's ability to grow if we don't address it. And, and by the way, most Caribbean countries have a similar problem. It's just like in most things, we've done it better than most, which means that we are in a worse situation with respect to that because we have our people living longer because of the investment we made in their education, their health, their other benefits. We have less babies dying because of the investment we've made in the medical um, system, but it means that people are drawing longer and because the retirement age was so early, it means that they're not in the workforce as we would like. And finally, I know uh, Minister Strong gave an indication um, earlier this month that government would be prepared to look at giving a leeway for pension funds specifically to invest overseas or in US dollar yeah, currency. The, tr the truth is that we also have not just to look at pension funds, but insurance companies. Do we have some anomalies in our system? And um, we started addressing it and looking at it just before COVID. And once again, that got put on the back burner, but we've resumed it again. The statutory fund for insurance companies, for example, allows them to invest in Commonwealth treasuries. But the US Treasury, which is the one that most people globally invest in, is not permissible there. Um, similarly, we recognize, just like with the NIS fund, if you put all of your eggs in one basket, that if there is an event that decimates the country, then those pension funds here and those pension funds in the NIS would suffer. So you do have to be able to diversify their investment. But I've also said as a government that I would like us not only to measure GDP, the output domestically, but I also want us to measure GNI, which is gross national income. In other words, the monies that we send overseas to invest. There are a number of Barbadian companies who during that last decade, if they didn't have investments and in companies in the rest of the region or in Central and Latin America, would have been in serious trouble. And the principle, therefore, that Minister Strong is speaking to is no different from that which those companies would have used to inform themselves to diversify their investments outside of Barbados. Uh, Prime Minister, seeing that you ended your contribution with a tourism area, I'm hoping to use your language, have a quick conversation. Uh, we found ourselves in the unfortunate position recently where we parted ways with the last chief executive officer of our mm -hmm. tourism marketing and cooperation. And to preface that, as you know, there are a number mm -hmm. of affordable destinations, luxury destinations mm -hmm. like Barbados, mm -hmm. that the average traveler has access to. As prime minister of this country, though, what kind of hospitality manager candidate do you think this country requires to truly take us to the next level? It seems that we have failed in coming out of COVID and trying to find the path we wanted to find because we parted ways with the person we chose. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I Prime Minister, what, what do you want to see? I think see? it was a mutually agreed, agreed partition, mm. um, departure. Um, I smile and say you might know the answer to that question better than me because you may have a more direct um, link to the kinds of skills that are needed in order to be able to promote hospitality in this country. Look, I am not happy with the fact that we ended up there. And, and you know, I'm not ever going to mince words with Bajans. But the reality is that there are not a lot of people in Barbados who work within the tourism sector who may be willing to come into the public sector. A lot of people in tourism, but do they want to come into the public sector? And that has been part and parcel of the constraint that we've had. 
Um, Mr. Griffith has left, but we've been working with Billy Griffith ever since, even though he has not been CEO of the BTMA. And I have an extremely warm relationship with him, and I've worked with him on a number of projects that he has had. Um, I've said to the Minister of Tourism, and by extension to the board, which has now been restructured again, that this is priority number one, and that we have to get it right. By the same token, we have recovered in most of our markets. The challenge remains the United States. The UK market is doing extremely well. The United States market is constrained primarily by airlift, but I believe that they have made some announcements in recent weeks showing that even the American Airlines flight out of Miami, that that has gone to just not just a third flight on Saturdays, but I think from November there's a three flights daily because they themselves know that the flight's coming in full and the truth is, my view is that the airline industry has tried to recover its losses in a short period of time and we are one of the victims of it. By the same token, I want to commend the board and the chairman and the minister. They've managed to bring to the table Bahamas Air, they've managed to bring to the table Caribbean Airlines and they've managed to look at other creative things that we're talking now out of the US but you have a shortage of planes and the other thing that you have a shortage of is pilots on the appropriate planes and therefore they have to get simulator time to be able to be able to fly a particular plane part of the difficulty is in this part of the world in the Americas even to get that simulator time in those um, I don't know if they call them labs or whatever they call them you have a long, 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 long waiting list. So even if Caribbean Airlines wanted to be able to get some additional planes now, they have to wait. Even if they got the planes and they don't have the pilots, they have to wait. So we are into a position where we are likely to have to do a number of things. Um, I hope that there will be another regional airline that will help open up the west coast of the, of the United States. And that should start by middle of of hopefully by the end of October. So that I'm satisfied that they're working hard. Um, can we do better? We can always do better. And will I insist that they do better? Of course I will insist that they do better. Um, but that's only one part of the equation. I look forward to the conversation on the 13th of September in the budget. I ask for a conversation, a colloquium, call it whatever you will, between workers and um, hotel owners and that conversation will take place on the 13th of September. Because, you see, part and parcel of the problem with COVID is that everybody has come up with angst and anxiety. And they weren't allowed to express it during COVID, but not just Barbados, globally, everybody is expressing it. The US has to deal and the UK has to deal with a significant reduction of people coming back into the labor market. People just decide that they're done with that, they ain't coming back out. And that's why you see them coming all about the Caribbean. We couldn't get transit visas for people to come in to help with the houses with the Chinese from China. We couldn't get them transit visas for them to come in from the UAE. It took us almost a year talking to the British and the Americans and they still won't give us visas. And all of a sudden, the British want nurses from here and the same Ghanaians that we had to charter a plane to bring them here because we couldn't get transit visas to bring them through the UK. The British all of a sudden now gain them visas to come to the UK. Same people. So that the world in which we live is different. And if we just take a linear view or one, a one-off thing from here, you will not get context, you will not get perspective. And therefore I ask Bajans, and this is something that I need to say, all of us from government to private sector to labor movement, I said it a little bit on Tuesday night, we need to all double down and dig harder and, di and dig deeper and work harder. Nobody owes us a living. If we want to change the trajectory of pensions, we know where we need to get by 2030. But we're not going to get there by just doing enough. You have to do more than enough to get through in this world today. And I can only say it, I can only advise, I can only repeat, but at the end of the day, there was the old time saying, you can carry a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. We can all talk these things, but it is only when the country comes together, and that's why the mission economy and its breakout is so important. That's why I talk so much trying to understand and to also to get people to understand and to break down things 
because I need more people lifting this weight in Barbados. I need more people being civil to each other. I need more people resolving conflict without guns. I need more people being able to put in more. If you could take a half hour lunch hour, I really don't need the hour, you could break off some more work, do it. If you could break off some more work on a weekend at home and take two hours when you would otherwise not look at it, do it. Because all of that ends up helping not just you, but the country. I keep saying do the job that we have, not the one that we want. And too many people want another job, but not prepared to do the job that they got. Straight talk. This is a heart to heart today. I, I, I want to go quick follow up. Can Please. you confirm that Barbados is looking to invest in a regional airline? With other, with, um, government? No, we have said that we are waiting to hear the facts. Um, CDB has been doing a study um, and until such time as we receive all the facts we can't make any comment one way or the other. What we have done is to facilitate Inter-Caribbean who has had some challenges but I believe that once they can set up their maintenance operation here and keep a plane here rather than having to fly back up to Turks all the time to deal with planes that will improve the quality of service that they deliver. We have also reached an agreement, an MOU agreement with the Caribbean Airlines and we hope to see them use Barbados as an expanded hub going forward because that is critical as I said at the, I said it at the end of the CARICOM Heads of Government meeting um, and, and that will mean more space for them at the airport as well as more staff in Barbados I suspect and more routes, routes coming through Barbados. So we have two major regional airlines there. We have an expanded relationship with Air Antilles, Antilles, depending on how you want to call it, if you're French or English. And we have an expanded relationship to come now, um, or new relationships to come with two Northern Caribbean airlines. So against that backdrop, we're not necessarily starting from the ground. And we also have from Suriname, also Fly Always, which is looking to cater to the Northern Caribbean through here to Jamaica, to Cuba, and of course to Guyana and Suriname in the Southern Caribbean. So um, I look forward to seeing the reports, but suffice it to say that we could not and cannot take actions. I'm a little concerned that the, we still pay the Caribbean Development Bank every quarter for the money for LIA. We have settled all the arrangements and those that had difficulties that felt that there were anomalies that is being resolved now as we speak. Cabinet has passed that, and the Ministry of Tourism will settle that with the LIAC workers. But we have three planes that were owned by LIAC. And you should perhaps ask, where are we with that? Because all of those things will go in to determine whether we can recoup anything from them to minimize the losses to CDB, so that we can then look at what is necessary for any new regional airline to supplement those that are there. I think only one of those three planes is flying now. One last question, Prime Minister. Um, we were talking about the train that's heading for us. Uh, you sorry? We were talking earlier about the train. The train you know what? Use the mic for the people who are online. Thanks. You were, you were talking before about the train that is heading towards us in terms of the pension, and we're back to the pension quickly. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot, clearly a lot of discussion that still needs to happen, but ideally, given the At time... At least six months more of public education. Okay. Possibly even a year, because we took a year to get here, mm. and we could take a year to continue to go in the nooks and crannies of every part of Barbados to be able to tell people the facts and not the fake news. Okay. That's the question? Yeah, it was actually about the timeline that you were looking yeah, at, yeah. given all that has to happen. I, I've said to the NAS mm -hmm. um, people, and, and let us take at, however long, at least six months, possibly 12 months, to continue to educate Barbadians. And I want to say this, you know, because the political rancor and undertone is most unfortunate. Who is the director of the NAS? What's her name, sorry? Oh, did Kim Trudeau run for the last government? the Democratic Labour Party, in fact, in my constituency. So that the fact that this government has been comfortable enough to engage her tells you all hands on deck. And that there are certain issues that must be above partisan consideration. And I'd like the members, therefore, of the Democratic Labour Party in particular, to apply their hearts to reason and to recognize that, first and foremost, you do not come to this with lily-white hands. 
In fact, you caused us to be in this in large measure, but we have chosen not to get any blame game because other governments along the way slap, slacken, 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 but they literally unleash. There must be a few issues in this country that the public of Barbados believes are above partisan consideration because if we keep fighting down in the trenches we will never solve the problems and decade after decade will pass and the problems remain and we will not only become uncompetitive but the quality of life of the average Barbadian will drop and that's why sometimes you just have to call a line spare the child and what? Spare the rod, sorry, and spoil the child. That is the problem. And, and small societies are difficult for people to have conversations because everybody knows each other. And if you care and you fee see somebody hurting, you say, oh, God. That's why we went and got the smallest needle for the, for the vaccines because most people didn't feel it. I tell them, no, I don't like needles. People don't like needles. Get the smallest one that you don't feel. But equally, you know if you don't give the child also or yourself, but please, when you got the cough, what can happen? You might end up with bronchitis or pneumonia. That's one. one We're going to go to the official Mr. funeral Mr. too soon. Quick question. Mm. And the boys usually carry it. Well, you might have to carry it because the mic, like the battery in the mic is yeah, in trouble. We have not had a Barbadian be vaccinated in the last month. That's based on statistics mm -hmm. from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. We have had our periodic um, numbers come to us and we've seen some deaths mostly of elderly people. Mm -hmm. But right now, you cannot get a vaccination about this if you feel you want to say be boosted mm -hmm. or even get your first dose. Mm -hmm. I How concerned are you about this and do you think government needs a refreshed public education we're, we're working on it and I certainly want to make sure that those who want it can get it and that will be addressed by us shortly I can't I'm not I'm not going to tell you how soon because I didn't talk to the Minister of Health before coming here but I give you the assurance that once we have the information I'll give it to you other than the time that I took when my brother passed away in 20 Oh dear, 2021, thank you. I haven't taken any time at all. And I will take, I was taking two weeks, but they're now cutting it by three days. So I'll be taking, it was three days from 11, from 14, 11 days, 10 days. I'm actually getting 10 days, and I'll go off tomorrow for 10 days. Um, obviously, Santia will be, will be here. I'm actually taking leave to get some rest <laughs> for 10 days. It's been a rough, rough. I didn't take any time before the election, they didn't take any time after the elections. We've been going non-stop trying to stabilize. I go tomorrow and come back. I, I, I have at the end of it to go and meet Senator Menendez. That's why I said that I have to leave where I am to go then to Washington for two days um, to meet some senators and to have some meetings in Washington that are critical for us. And I'll be back here on the morning of the, I think lunchtime, the 8th. So two weeks from today I'll be back, but I actually will be working from the six. So Ms. Bradshaw will be in charge for two weeks? Absolutely. And I pray that I'll be out of the island. I pray that there will be no untoward events, but Sabu says that it looks as though almost everything is going north in the next two to three weeks. But he is not God, and therefore we can't hold him to that. But I will be engaged if there is any reason to. I think you know my style. Okay. Are there any more Anything questions? Else? I want to thank you. Um, we spent a long time today, but I felt that we needed to do that, particularly on the pension reform. I want you to speak to Mr. Ian Carrington, the Director of Finance, and to Ms. Tudor if you want to again, but in particular to get a non-political set of answers and validation of almost everything here. And everything that I've said here, is capable of independent proof and we've given you some graphs and some data but we can always continue to give you more as is necessary because it is important that the people of Barbados maintain confidence in the public pension in the um, public pension system national security system that social security system sorry that we have okay thank you very much and be safe in this weather thank you